if you were to put a list together of the best racers we've ever seen in supercars, Garth Tander's name would undoubtedly make that list. The four-time Bathurst winner these days does far more than only driving, so it was fascinating to sit down with him for this episode of Spirited Conversations. Garth Tander, thank you for joining me. You need no introduction to the viewers, but I'd like to start by rewinding to the start of your career and telling us a little bit about how you started in motorsport and where your career began, where the journey began to get you to this point. My family or my father was involved in motorsport before I came on the scene and my brother came on the scene and we were always exposed to race cars. My dad never drove, but he always worked on race cars. He's not a mechanic, he was actually a house painter by trade. But there was always a race car in the shed, so we were always going up to Wanneroo Raceway from a young age. And then I started actually playing AFL footy, and I broke my arm twice playing AFL footy as a young fellow before I was eight. And then dad realised that you could buy go-karts, and even mum agreed that go-karts were probably safer than football, because I'd already broke my arm twice. So I started racing karts when I was eight on the dirt originally, and then moved on to bitumen when I was about 12, and raced karts till I was 16, 17, and then moved into Formula Ford. Had some success in karts though, raced against Marcus Ambrose, Todd Kelly, Mark Webber, um, a lot of those guys in karts. And then when we moved into Formula Ford, I did the WA State Championship, and then the Australian Formula Ford Championship, which I was fortunate enough to have won in 1997. And I beat Marcus Ambrose to that title, Todd Kelly was third, so, it was a good year, but we'd ultimately we ran out of money at the end of 97. Dad had actually done some sort of dodgy deal and refinanced the house to fund the racing. Mum didn't know about that one. And we got to the end of 97 and won the Formula 4 Championship, but no budget to do anything in 98. So I went back and worked as a mechanic on the Formula Ford team that I won the championship for in 97. So I started the 98 year as a mechanic. And then Stephen Richards, who was driving for Gary Rogers Motorsport at the time as a teammate with Jason Barguana, got an opportunity to go to the UK and race for the Nissan Factory British Touring Car Championship team. And so he effectively flew home from Lakeside in March 1998, back to Melbourne, grabbed his bags and flew straight to the UK. And Gary Rogers Motorsport had, a, had an opening, so JRM offered me the seat. And um, it was a race by race deal for all of 98 and uh, got a full-time contract in 99 and the rest, they say, is history. Even when you weren't driving, you were still working in the sport as a mechanic, so there's a definite motorsport bug there that bit you from a young age. What about motorsport is so addictive that keeps people coming back? For me, it's the competition and the pursuit of excellence. And that doesn't matter if you're a driver or a mechanic or an engineer or in the PR department. Motorsport's always about success and striving to be the best. Doesn't matter what your role is. And, um, and I really enjoy that. I enjoy the team environment in motorsport. Motorsport's often seen as a singular individual sport because the driver's the one that gets it, the, the accolades. But I really enjoy the team aspect of it. And I enjoy the fact that you can take something, build it, perfect it and win with it. And it's like your little project, like a race car is effectively your little project that you can work with and make better and go faster. So I just enjoy all those aspects of excellence in sport and always striving to be better at it. You've been exposed to a lot of high performing environments. We talk about excellence. Tell us about some of the high performance teams that you've been a part of. You don't win a championship by mistake and you won the championship back in 2007. You've got four Bathurst wins under your belt. You've been in some really high performing environments. So tell us what has made that one step higher than the rest. Uh, it's a very simple analogy, but you need to make sure everyone's rowing the boat in the same direction. And that goes right from the top to the apprentice that's in, in their first year in the industry. And you've got to have buy-in for everyone that the, the journey that you're on is the right journey and the way that you're navigating that journey or the way that you're achieving that journey is the way to go. So if you can get buy-in from the troops, if you like, the guys on the ground, the guys in the garage, that the man management and the driver group and the engineering group headed this ship in the right direction and everyone believes in that, then it all flows very easily. When there starts to be lack of belief, doesn't matter at what level, things start to go awry, if you like, and they don't, you're not all then rowing the boat in the same direction. So teamwork is a critical part. Um, belief is a critical part. Communication, I think, um, 
Good race teams have exceptional communication um, and very open communication. And the third year apprentice feels like he can walk into the managing director's office and, ha and voice an opinion and feel that that opinion will be heard. And it's the same if you're the driver with the mechanics or the team manager with you know, the drivers. It doesn't matter what interaction that relationship is, the communication needs to be very open and very two-way. Can't be authoritative. So it's fair to say that the highest performing teams put their people first. Then when you're in those environments, what do you think makes those people stay? And that's one of the beautiful things about this paddock. What is the key to that longevity? Oh, look, I think um, you need to have a rewarding workplace. And, you know, race teams are a place where you can do that in a very public way. Because if you're winning, then it's seen to be rewarding. But just because you're winning races doesn't mean you're in a rewarding workplace. So for me, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very two-way street. It's not a give, it's not a take, take, take relationship. It's a give and take relationship. Motorsport, there are times when you'll have to work seven days a week, you'll have to work late nights, you'll be away from your family for a huge amount of time. If you're a race team that expects your staff to do that day in, day out, with very little reward, or very, very little acknowledgement of the effort that they're putting in, your staff's not gonna hang around long. They're, they're gonna go either leave the industry or go to another team that are appreciative of the effort that's put in. So, um, you know, it's pretty simple. Look after the people that look after you. <laughs> and how do you as a driver look after those people and be the leader that they look up to when you're on track and make sure that they're looking up to you off track as well? Again, simple, lead by example. Don't expect someone to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. There might be roles within the race team that I'm not technically able to do, but you know, don't ask someone to do something that's unrealistic. And also, I get to know everyone in the team, like simple, like, you know, how are your kids? How was soccer on the weekend for the family? Is the, how's the wife? Always have an interest in everyone in the race team because you know everything's always very centred on the driver. All the media attention is centred on the driver. The performance of the car is centred on the driver. But as the driver, you need to make sure that everyone in the team feels appreciative and you've got their back as much as they've got yours. So just knowing a little bit about everyone's family or a little bit about everyone's background or where they've come from or the journey that they're on makes a big difference. Let's shift gears slightly. Let's look at the sport as a whole. From your seat on both sides of the steering wheel, if you like, as a driver and as your current role in TV, what's your take on the current state of play of the sport? Oh, look, I think the sport's in an exciting phase. It's cha just changed ownership. There's been probably a few years of consolidation of the sport, and now we're in this phase where there's a lot of excitement around the pit lane and a lot of optimism about the future of the sport because new owners brings new enthusiasm, a fresh injection of ideas into the sport and wanting to continue to rebuild the sport and bring it back to a sort of heyday, if you like, of big crowds, big events, um, lots of families coming to the racetrack um, and a real, I think, you know, so there's lots of enthusiasm around the sport and I'm really excited by that myself, having been involved in this sport for 25 odd years now. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, really keen to see what the future holds. Now you're a motorsport fan in general, and it's not exclusive to supercars, but we can sit down and have a chat about the latest Formula One or motor, latest MotoGP race. But how does supercars stand up against all those other international categories? What makes supercars such a high level and such a progressive sport? Oh, bang for buck. Simple as that. The show that supercars are able to put on for the investment is probably not many motorsport categories in the world that would be able to do what we do for the money that we spend. I know a lot of my friends that race in Europe are very envious of the racing product that we have here. A lot of my teammates in the GT Championship that are based in, the U in Germany and in Europe all want to come and race supercars because they see that the racing is fantastic, the spectacle's great, we race on really great circuits, we've got a lot of diversity in our championship, we race on street circuits, we race on semi-permanent circuits, we race on permanent circuits, we have Bathurst. So our sport, bang for buck, is exceptional. I mean, you think about the money that's spent in Formula One, the money that's spent in MotoGP, they're the two pinnacle motorsport categories, four wheels and two wheels. I mean, we would be spending less than 1% of what they spend, but their show is easily as good, if not better than what they put on. Now, we just touched upon your transition to a TV career. That change was thrown upon you very quickly, and it was one of the biggest stories 
of our, of our sport back in 2019. How did you make that transition, that massive life change? How, how did you go about tackling that almost on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, look, I have um, been doing a little bit of TV stuff whilst I was still racing full-time. I was doing a few bits and pieces here and there. And I had a year basically away from the paddock. I, I co-drove with Shane Van Gisbergen in, in 2019 at Bathurst, Sandown and the Gold Coast. But I was pretty much away from the paddock for a full year. But I was working with Channel 10 uh, on their RPM program. And that sort of gave me enough to learn a little bit about that. And I was always interested in a potential change into the media side of our sport. Very, very few opportunities. So I feel very fortunate, one, to be able to talk about the sport that I love and give back to the sport now because, you know, I had a great full-time career. I very, feel very fortunate. The fact that I even had a career for me is a highlight. So I feel fortunate now that I get to talk about that sport that I love. I get to help tell the viewers at home what's going on, try and explain what's going on. And I always just look at it from the point of view that if someone that's sitting on the couch watching the telecast is a casual observer of our sport, so not a hardcore motorsport fan, but someone that just knows what Bathurst is, sort of knows who Jamie Winkup or Craig Lowndes might be, try and explain to them how they would understand what's going on in our sport. So that's sort of how I've sort of tried to do it. And um, I'm really enjoying it. I've got a lot to learn still, but um, yeah, I feel very fortunate. What has been the biggest learning curve of this transition so far? The biggest learning curve has, has probably been just have enough confidence to just fire in and ask questions, to be honest. I'm happily to call play-by-play -play or explain something like, here's a wheel nut, this is how it works, I'll explain that. But I haven't done a whole lot of interviews and things like that. Because when you're racing full-time in the championship, you don't go into everyone else's garage. You just stay in your own little garage, you're in your own little world, focused on your own job and working with your own team. Whereas now, in this role, there's 24 cars and I've got to stay on top of every one of those 24 cars, so I might have to fire into someone's garage who was a massive competitor of mine for 20 years and start asking hard questions. So for me, the challenging bit is just being, one, knowing that I'm allowed to go in there, but two, also having the confidence to fire in and ask some hard questions, which I'm getting better at slowly. Now the future of the sport. We've got Gen 3 coming in, which is a really exciting time. Where do you see the future of our sport over the next almost five years or so? Yeah, I think the next five years are an interesting period in time because we've seen over the journey manufacturers, motor manufacturers, slowly migrate away from motorsport, not just here in Australia, but globally. And I think the reliance of motor manufacturers in Australia has been heavy for a long time. And we're slowly starting to migrate away from that. So with Gen 3 coming in, lowering the costs, the upfront costs of building a, a car and a car that's capable of going racing, the running costs of those cars being lower takes away some of that reliance on manufacturer money. So that's cause for optimism for the future and excitement. And then you couple that with the change of ownership of the sport, uh, new owners coming in with a new car for 23. Um, yeah, I think it's really exciting times. I, I cannot remember a time in our sport where there has been this level of change, but this level of optimism because of that change. So I think it's an exciting time. Now your own family. You've got two young-ish children uh, who are showing a bit of an interest in, on four wheels. How's that going? How's, how's being a karting dad? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's fun. It really is fun. I guess our kids didn't have much of a choice given dad races, mum used to race. They grew up at the racetrack. I think my daughter Scarlett was six months old when I won Bathurst in 2011 and she was there. And they've been coming to the racetrack since they were born effectively. So they see driving go-karts like it is playing Auskick or, or cricket. So it's fun, it's fun. It's, um, it's challenging because um, I'm a competitive individual, but they have to go at their own speed. And very much also that it's their thing. Both Leanne and I have been very mindful of the fact that we don't want to be seen as, um, as trophy parents, chasing, you know, pushing our kids into something that we enjoy, but they might not necessarily enjoy. So um, we only go to races that they want to go to. We only go and practice when they want to go and practice. So when my young son, Sebastian, who's eight, he would be at the racetrack every day if, he, if, he, if I let him. So we've definitely got one there that's very, very keen. So just tempering that and uh, just, if he goes okay, we'll give him every opportunity. So um, yeah, no, we really enjoy it. 
Well, Garth, we've covered a fair bit of ground and it's been fascinating getting your insights. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jess.